Well, good morning. Good morning. morning. Happy Sunday to everybody. Uh, March 28th, 2021, what the church calendar tells us is Palm Sunday. So happy Palm Sunday to everybody, which means we're a week away from celebrating Easter uh, together. Um, a few announcements before we get started. Um, we are finishing up our uh, Lent devotions this week. Uh, for those who have been on the journey with us, we started on Ash Wednesday. We'll finish up on Easter Sunday, but each and every day we'll still have our devotions. I send them to you both by email and also uh, on the Facebook page. So if you want to get our last week's worth and you're not, uh, let me know and I'll be glad to, to help you out and put you on our email list. My email address is going to be great. Um, Easter Sunday morning, we're having our 6.30 a.m. sunrise service. It'll be just right outside here, out by the locks at the canal. Uh, us and Ebenezer Baptist are going to get together and participate in that. So that's about 6.30 a.m. on the Easter Sunday. They're not having the breakfast afterwards, but we will have the service uh, over there. We'll have our normal, uh, of course, 10 o'clock service here uh, on uh, Easter Sunday. Uh, the day before, which is Good Friday, we're doing a Stations of the Cross uh, worship service. I don't know what you really want to call it, but it's going to be down at Camden from 11 to 1, anytime between 11 and 1, or anytime between 6 and 8, a good Friday night. Come to Camden Methodist Church. You can walk the Stations of the Cross. Now, for those that are unfamiliar with what that means is in the early history of our church, pilgrims would go to Jerusalem and walk the same path that Jesus walked from Pilate's headquarters all the way up to where he was crucified. Well, of course, it's expensive to try to go to Jerusalem each and every year to do that. So what ended up happening was churches began to do it at their own church. And they would have statues, they would have iconography, they would have paintings, pictures, whatever it was. But you would go station to station remembering the path that our Lord took uh, from, again, Pilate's headquarters up to Calvary. We'll be doing that same thing down at, at Camden. Now, if you can't make it uh, on uh, Friday, what I've done is, is I've created a booklet that uh, are the Stations of the Cross. All the stations are in here, all the scriptures, the devotions, uh, re reflections, the prayers, and there are copies here for everybody here on this first pew if you want to grab it. Now, I did send it out by email and also by uh, on Facebook, but I, I like to hold it, honestly. So I have copies of the booklet here for you, so if you want to grab that. And on top of that, I'll do a video one that I'll send out sometime this week as well, so you can watch it from the comfort of your own home if you'd rather do that. Um, there's a lot of stuff I give you today. You can't say you don't have enough for Holy Week because um, Daily Bread has also sent us uh, Easter devotions. So there's copies of this little book up here for you as well. And if 6.30 is just too early for you and you'd rather stay home, um, I've already printed out copies of the Easter Sunrise Service uh, bulletin. In here are all the prayers we're going to pray, all the scriptures we're going to read, all the songs that McKinley is going to sing, those lyrics. Only thing not in here is my sermon. And that may or may not be a good thing, depending on your, you know. <laughs> but it's all, it's all in here. I'm also going to live stream it from my Facebook page. So again, if you want to be up, but don't want to come out, you can wake up, you can watch it, you can follow along with this particular bulletin. It's all right here. So you got Daily Bread Devotions, Easter Sunrise, Stations of the Cross, all here on the front uh, pew. So I think that's about it for me. Um, oh, no, uh, Ruritans on the 10th in New Lamb have barbecue chicken. And then South Mills have their uh, chicken pan pie, right? right? Juanita's got tickets, right? right. Very good. Anybody else with an announcement, a prayer request, a joy, anything on their mind this morning? Yes, ma'am, Rose. Uh, one day I'm going to have, you got to know that I've got some digestive problems, and one day they're going to do an endoscopy, and a Thursday a colonoscopy, so keep me in your prayers that Hopefully they can find out what the issue is and we can get it resolved. Absolutely. So we'll do. Thank you. Anybody else this morning? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer together. O oh Lord, you rode on. You rode over the cloaks and under the branches. You rode through the shouts and past the praises receiving the praise that you deserve, but not confusing our praise in your presence for your purpose in coming. O oh Lord, you rode on. You rode towards the controversy and the cost. You rode towards the curses and the cross, receiving the stripes you didn't deserve to give us a reward that we couldn't earn. 
Oh, Lord, you rode on. You rode through the tomb and the grave. You rode through our time and space, ascending to a throne that will never decay, a priesthood that will never pass away, a life of love that will always remain, and hearing us even now as we pray. Oh, Lord, you rode on. We remember the journey you have taken as we commit ourselves to walking in the same way. Give us the strength, hope, and joy we need as we follow. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, our opening hymn this morning is found on page 278 of our hymnal. Hosanna, loud Hosanna. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. Verses 1 and 3, page 278. you now to join me as we say together our call to worship. Let us worship the Lord, not just with our voices, but also with our entire being. Your presence demands our participation. Our worship is never wasteful. Be gracious to us, O Lord. We are your servants. Empty us for your use. We are Christ's servants, and may we be on the same time. We, we declare that Jesus Christ, Christ is Lord, Lord to the, the glory of God the Father. Amen. Praise be unto God. Well, as we come to our first reading of Scripture for this Sunday morning, and we await with joyous anticipation what it is the Lord would have revealed to us through His written Word, I'd like to invite you to join me as we say together our prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of Your Holy Spirit, that as the Scriptures are read and Your Word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first reading this Palm Sunday comes from John chapter 12, verses 12 through 18. So again, this is John chapter 12, verses 12 through 18. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival, that being Passover, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, when they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. My friends, this is the word of God 
for you and I, the children of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And that brings us, sisters and brothers, to our time of confession before God and, and one another. And we talk about this every week because it bears repeating every week, because it's true every week. This is our chance to come clean, as it were. We talked in one sermon a number of weeks ago about how we really should come to repentance each and every day before God. But this Sunday and every Sunday in the, in the silence of our confession, it gives us a chance to review the past week and those places we slipped, those places we fell, and to come to God and say, listen, I realize that. I'm sorry and I seek your forgiveness. Yes, our God is a just God, but our God is also a merciful God, willing to forgive his beloved sons and daughters, asking only that we come to him with an honest heart. In that vein, friends, let us now pray a prayer of confession together first in silence. Let us pray. Patient God, we confess that we love a parade. We are very happy to see banners waving and hear people shouting their praises. Our hearts thrill to the spectacle, but we fail to see the sadness on the face of the Savior. Our shouts block out his sorrow. He comes to us as king, and we expect that royal treatment will follow we do not and cannot believe that in a few days we will be among those who will turn our backs and run from his presence. How fickle we are, O oh Lord. Yet you continually forgive us and call us to turn our lives around, to see the needs of others, to reach out in trust and faith, to be willing to witness to your good news of saving love. Heal our hearts and give us courage for the days ahead. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I want you to just not hear but also believe in this good news. In the name of Christ Jesus, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I want you to join me now, friends, as we in one voice make our statement of faith, we make our confession of faith, we say those things we know in our hearts to be true, those words as contained in our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Our sermon text this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark. It's another retelling of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We'll be in chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. So again, this is Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought to the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. 
Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. My friends, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks be to God. What's the latest you've ever been for something? I don't mean so late that you said, forget it, I, I can't go now, but slowly, something you actually went to. How late were you? Anybody ever been late for a wedding rehearsal? For a wedding that you were in? That happened to me. Back in 2002, one of my best friends growing up, a guy I roomed with all four years at Carolina, was getting married. And they decided to get married over Labor Day weekend. And instead of having a Saturday wedding, they had a Sunday wedding. Well, Labor Day weekend, as many of you well know, is also historically the beginning of the college football season. And so on the Saturday before the wedding, instead of the groomsmen going and playing golf or whatever, or the bridesmaids having a bridesmaids luncheon or whatever it is that y'all do, the entire wedding party decided, well, you know what? Let's go to Chapel Hill for the first football game of the season. Now, the wedding was in Sanford, which is about 45 minutes away from Chapel Hill. The bride was a Lee County girl. Kickoff was at 1.30. Games usually last about three hours or so. Rehearsal wasn't until around 6.30. So we figured we had plenty of time to get to Carolina and watch the game and get back in time to change and go to rehearsal. I was one of the ones that drove, so off we went. One thing you have to understand about that campus is, as beautiful as it is, there's really not that many places to park and tailgate for a football game. Usually what you have to do is to try and find a place either in a parking deck or somewhere out in the street and then walk to your particular favorite establishment. And so that's what we did. There's a parking deck on Rosemary Street, which is parallel to Franklin Street. And we got there in more than enough time to kind of hang out. So we found a place, we parked, we went to that particular place. It's a perfect plan. Well, if you look at the box score for that game, I did that this week just to verify some things. Toward the bottom, it lists game time and temperature and weather. And for weather, it had two words, heavy rain. And it did. It rained the whole time. But we didn't care, right? We've sat in rain football games before. We're back at our alma mater, having a good time. First game of the year, playing Miami of Ohio. Who the heck is that even? So it's going to be an easy win for the boys. Should be a good time, even in the rain. What we didn't count on was this. First, Carolina turned the ball over nine times in that rain. And second, Miami had this sophomore quarterback none of us had ever heard of before. He had a funny name, but he ended up being pretty good. Uh, his name was Ben Roethlisberger. I don't know if you've heard of him. Anyway, the heels lose 27-21. So off we head back to the parking deck. It's about 4.30 or so now. It's a 15, 20-minute walk. We're soaked from head to toe. We're disgruntled because Carolina lost. We get to the parking deck. We go to our level, go to our space. And the car's not there. And so it was me and Heidi and a friend of mine and his wife, and we verified we were on the right level. We were at the right space. There's still no car. So I go to that little booth where the guy was sitting where you get your ticket to come in and then pay him to get out. And I described the car that I was driving at the time. He thought for a minute. He said, oh, yeah, they towed it. Evidently, I had parked on one of the parking space lines instead of in between them. In the town of Chapel Hill, that is a huge no-no. So they towed it. Now it's about 5 o'clock, but we're still okay, timeline. I assume that the company that towed the car was a Chapel Hill company. No. The company was actually from Swepsonville. Anybody here heard of Swepsonville? All right. Swepsonville, well, I need you to have Swepsonville is about half an hour in the other direction. Now, by now, everybody else has left. They're on their way back to Sanford for the rehearsal. It's just the four of us. 
So I had to go to a pay phone. Y'all remember pay phones? Call the guy that towed the car, have him drive half an hour to get me, drive me half an hour to get my car, so I could drive in half an hour back to get everybody, and then drive 45 minutes to second. Well, by the time we get back, it's like 7 o'clock. <laughs> so I change real quick, get to the church. My clothes are all wrinkled. I didn't have a chance to iron them. I've been wearing a hat in the rain for all day, so you know what my hair looked like. Still a little bit wet. And as I walk into the church doors, they're actually practicing coming in. So I just find where my spot's supposed to be, and I jump in and walk in as if I'd been there the whole time and didn't fool a single person. Now, my, my buddies thought it was funny. Um, the bride, not so much. And I didn't look at either sets of parents because I didn't want to see what they were thinking. But what's funny is that I hate being late. I really hate it. Sometimes I'm often almost too early for stuff. But it was not that way in 2002, and I can't tell you how many times at the rehearsal dinner people came up and reminded me, hey, the wedding tomorrow's at 2, make sure you get there. All right. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. But when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. At youth this past Sunday night, we talked about how this story of Jesus' triumphal entry is told in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all talk about it. But each one of the gospel writers makes reference to a particular point, a particular way of telling the story that's important to them. For instance, Mark's gospel that we read this morning is the only reference to Jesus going into the temple, looking around, and then leaving. Why? Why did he go into the temple, look around, and scoot right back to Bethany? Well, Scripture says because it was already late. Which got me to wondering. What if this is more about than just the time of day? What if Jesus was late getting somewhere or doing something? Around this time, Jerusalem held about 40,000 people. But at Passover, that number increased to 240,000 people. And given the joyous shouts of celebration as Jesus entered into the city, I have no doubt in my mind he could have found somebody to put him up for the night in Jerusalem. Yet, he chose to go back to Bethany. What could Jesus have been late for? I came across a unique idea this week that I tried to unpack, and I kind of like it. What if Jesus wanted to go back to Bethany because he was late getting that colt back to its owner? I tend to agree with that, and here's why. Because there's another unique aspect of Mark's account of this triumphal entry story. Not only is he the only one to say Jesus goes into the temple and he looks around and he leaves and goes back to Bethany, Mark is also the only one that talks about Jesus telling the disciples to tell the cult owner to promise to return the cult to that owner. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say that Jesus borrowed the cult. John this morning says he just found it, but Mark says that Jesus promised to return the colt. The Lord needs it, verse 3, and will send it back here, meaning Bethany, immediately. What if that's why Jesus left the temple? What if that is what he was late for? Remember, verse 1 says they're in Bethany because Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead, and they get the colt as they're making their way into Jerusalem. Verse 11 says he goes back to Bethany. And if we keep on reading, verse 12 says, hey, he goes back from Bethany back into Jerusalem. Bethany is like two miles away from Jerusalem. A fairly easy walk. Maybe Jesus left the temple because he wanted to keep his promise and follow through on what exactly he said he was going to do. Maybe this is about Jesus being true to himself and keeping his word. What if this is about Jesus staying centered within himself despite what the upcoming week is going to hold for him? And what if returning the colt is a metaphor for us as we enter into and walk through Holy Week? So you say, metaphor for what? What does returning the colt mean for us throughout Holy Week? I think it's an image we need to think about because it raises at least a couple of questions. One, is there something that you 
need to return this week? Is there something you need to release or let go of? We all have this stuff that we have carried around for far too long. Things that are no longer able to take us anywhere or give us life. It's just baggage that we carry that continues to weigh us down. It destroys the abundant life that God wants for us. It corrupts our hearts. What do you need to let go of or release or return this week? Is it a grudge? Resentment? Anger? Fear? Disappointment? Guilt? Envy? Maybe you need to return the need to always be in control. The need to always be right. The need for approval. The need to be perfect. I don't know what it is for you, friend, but I'm convinced that all of us have our stuff. Maybe Holy Week is the time to return it and release it all to God, trusting that our Creator can do something with all this stuff that we are never able to do ourselves. And if we return it, that means what? Not trying to get it back. And what if returning and releasing this stuff is also about returning to ourselves? What if it's about returning to our center? What if it's about reclaiming our truest self, our authentic self? That means then we can move forward. Not from the same old place, but from a newly recovered center. Because that's what Jesus did. He stayed true to himself all this week. And so should we. So maybe returning the cult is ultimately about us returning to our original selves, our identities as sons and daughters of the Most High, our understanding that all of us are image bearers of the Creator, that God created and has loved us since the very beginning. Then letting that understanding of who we are guide us. What if those are the two movements we're called to take part in this week? Returning, releasing, and letting go of all the negative stuff and returning to and reclaiming those parts of ourselves that have been lost or ignored or forgotten or maybe even denied. Even as we carry around that stuff that needs to be returned, there also are parts of ourselves and our lives that we need to return to and to reclaim. What if this week we return to ourselves? Which leads to another question. What is it you need to return to? What if we return to joy and hope and beauty and truth and honesty? What if we came back to justice and mercy and forgiveness? What if we reclaim the dignity and holiness of each human life? What if we recenter ourselves in peace and courage? What if we return to love of neighbor and love of self and love of even our enemy? Coming back to ourselves would then be like a whole new life. Wouldn't it? So we begin this week by returning the cult. What stuff do you need to return and to what do you need to return? Those are our two questions. And answer then, we have to look around at everything because that's what Jesus did when he came into the temple, right? He went into the temple and he looked around at everything. But understand, looking around at everything doesn't necessarily mean just looking on the outside. That means looking around at everything on the inside. Look at what's there. Look at what's missing. Look at what you need, what you feel, who you truly are and who you want to be. So yes, returning the cult is how Holy Week begins. But returning to God is the promise of how this week will end. Friends, look around at everything and then go return the colt. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our prayer this morning is going to be a responsive prayer. You'll hear me say, Lord, in your mercy, and you'll say, hear our prayer. So again, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and you'll respond by saying, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Glory be to you, Lord Jesus Christ. By your cross and precious blood, you have redeemed the whole world. Hosanna in the highest. 
Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You were acclaimed Son of David and Son of God by the pilgrims in Jerusalem. Fill your church with faithfulness, boldness, and compassion. Through its witness, cause many to sing, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You were met by people crying, Hosanna. Grant your salvation to your followers who are persecuted for naming you as Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You accepted the praises of the crowds who worshipped in Jerusalem. Fill this congregation with such love for you that we eagerly worship you. Humbly do your will and lovingly serve our neighbor in your name. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You were greeted with sweet hosannas by little children. We pray for our little ones and for the children throughout the world that their mouths might be made perfect in praising your name. Lord, in your mercy. You enter Jerusalem as the Prince of Peace. Fill the leaders of the nations with a hunger for peace, a thirst for justice, and a love for the people entrusted to their care. Lord, in your mercy. You enter Jerusalem on a donkey, not a war horse. Fill all places of violence with your peace. Protect and bless those who stand in harm's way. Bring them safely home to their loved ones. Lord, in your mercy. Hear you were greeted with joy as you entered the holy city. Fill with joy the hearts of all who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, especially those we name before you now, either aloud with our lips or silently in our hearts. Turn their sorrow into joy, their suffering into health, and their cries for help into shouts of praise. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. You open the gates of the new Jerusalem for all who die trusting in you. Thank you for receiving them into that glorious city. Bring peace and hope to all who grieve. Fill us with imperishable hope so that we gladly follow where you lead us until you lead us safely home. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Accept our prayers, dear Jesus, and lay them at your Father's throne. Let all that pleases him be done to your glory and the good of your people. We pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we pray the words that he taught us all how to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Well, as we come now to the time of our prayer for our offering, I want to say thank you to everybody for your consistent and faithful giving and my appreciation for that as well as a prayer for the anticipation of our future gifts. So which you would join me now as we say a prayer for our offerings. <clears throat> Almighty and everlasting God, as we bring our gifts and lay them at your altar, we remember the crowds in Jerusalem who laid their cloaks on the road shouting, Hosanna, as Jesus passed. We know they were looking for a Messiah who was different from the one you sent Jesus to be. Not one of political power and military might, but one who came in compassion and mercy to heal, love, and save. Search our hearts that we might be confident that the Messiah for whom we long is the one you know we need. Jesus Christ, your anointed one, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, our closing hymn this morning is found on page 298 of our hymnals, 298. When I survey the wondrous cross, we'll sing verses 1 and 4, verses 1 and 4 on page 298.
come to the end of our worship time together this morning, I want to remind you that all of our Holy Week stuff is up here on this first pew. So make sure you come and, and grab one before you make your way out. But I want to offer to you now these words of our benediction. Now you have waved your palms at him. Now you have followed him on the parade route. You have seen Jesus for yourself. You know that he is real. Go forth and continue to see him in the world. Go where he goes and do what he commands. And may the peace of God rule and abide with you now and forever. Amen.